good afternoon, good evening. And I think there's much people from around the world. So I'll just say good night <laughs> as well. Um, this is developer testing for accessibility. Um, going to do a quick intro really quick. Tony, I'll let you introduce yourself first. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tony Kornmeyer. Uh, I've worked at DQ Systems for about five years. Um, the developer services team lead. Uh, mostly that means I've been working with companies uh, all over the place, helping them integrate uh, accessibility into their automated tests and uh, things like that. Thanks, Tony. Um, I'm Mark Stebman. I also work at DQ Systems. Um, I'm on the developer services team. Um, I've been working in developer testing accessibility for about five years now. Um, so yeah, pretty similar to what Tony is. Um, the other person in our presentation is Jeff Cato. Um, I'm going to introduce Jeff and let Jeff introduce himself a little bit later into this presentation because um, he will kind of set a tone for the presentation. So without further ado, um, I'm going to jump right into why we're here. So today we're going to kind of tell a story and what that story is going to be is we're going to talk about starting from no developer testing being done to the challenges that we're running into setting up this process of getting developer testing set up, right? to finding the right set of testing tools, to developing a strategy to roll out testing tools to developers, right? And using automation in the build process to test for accessibility violations after every build, right? Developing a strategy around those issues to fix as well, right? A lot of people that me and Tony work with daily, what we run into is people don't know the developer testing for accessibility, it exists, you can do it, right? And a lot of people don't know that. And so what we're gonna do today is yes, we're gonna get into the ins and outs of developer testing, showing off some of the tools that we have at the queue. But a lot of people don't know that you can actually, the process to get there, it takes a while. And so Jeff's gonna kind of take us on a story through that um, to get to that developer testing for accessibility, right? So the challenges, okay? Um, there's a lot of challenges you have with accessibility testing for developers. Mainly it's accessibility testing has been seen as a clunky process. It can slow down everything you do, right? It's just not the case. You have to know where the tools are for it to go. But in reality, there's lots of tools that do exist. The myth right now is that only manual accessibility testing tools exist. And all the tools that are out there, they take a lot of time to test for accessibility, right? And the time and effort are just not there to do accessibility testing and organizations don't have buy-ins. I've been there, I've done that, I know what you're at when you say, hey, we don't have the time, we don't have the effort to do accessibility testing. I've been there, I've lived it 110%, right? And all of you guys that are on here that are developers, you may know, we live in an agile world. Things need to get out the door quickly, right? And so accessibility testing is seen as this clunky, slow process that you can't get into, right? And it's just not the case. And in Jeff's story here in a minute, you're gonna see, that this is not actually the case. The truth be told, right? An unorganized approach to accessibility as previously stated, yes, it can cause clunkiness and so many different problems leading into it, right? But there are automated accessibility testing tools that can speed up the testing time that it can take, right? So I can have something that fits seamlessly into my development workflows. And what I mean by that is it's something I can place within my unit test cases or within my QA process, right? Um, those tools do exist. Mm -hmm. And the other thing too is there's extending testing tools, right? So what I just said before, we're extending into what you already have, right? Um, there's also things that will catch up to 50% of accessibility violations. So the tools that we're gonna show are gonna be a test and Jeff will talk on that here in just a second, but those catch up to 50% of accessibility violations, right? You can actually use the automated tools to report issues in HTML and XML formats. You can use it within like Jenkins builds or something like that, right? Um, the other thing that some automated tools do, and these do specifically, is they teach developers how to remediate accessibility issues. Um, and they create developers that are accessibility aware during development. And I can't preach that enough, right? This story we're gonna tell is gonna start from the beginning to the end of the process of starting with no development testing to where we are now, right? And if you look at this slide that we're on right now, when we say these, these tools we're gonna talk about, they fit seamlessly into workflows, they extend your testing tools you already have. You're catching 50% of accessibility violations, right? The biggest thing is that they're teaching developers how to remediate accessibility issues, right? And you're creating developers that then can own it, right? They become accessibility aware during the development process and now you're making accessibility, uh, accessible content 
as it goes out the door, right? And that's the goal of doing accessibility testing for developers is getting it to the point where developers now own those issues. They know what they're, what they're putting out into production, right? So if I'm coding with Tony, Tony checks and Cody goes in at the end of the night and I look back at it and say, Hey, come in the next day. Hey, we got issues, right? That's what we try to get to is teaching developers that, Hey, accessibility issues do exist and these tools can actually get into it. So I'm going to quit talking for a little bit and I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Cato. He's going to talk about the process um, at Providence Health and starting from that square one that we talked about and moving into developer testing, having that shift left mentality where we're actually talking about this um, at the development level. So Jeff, I will turn it over to you now. Thank you, Mark. Greetings, everyone. It is great to be with you today. Um, I'm giving you a, a brief bio on myself. Uh, my name is Jeff Cato, as Mark mentioned. I am a quality assurance test manager for Providence St. Joseph Health. I'm based in Portland, Oregon, and I've been with the IT division of my co company for 22 years. In the beginning, I, I was a service desk technician, eventually leading up to where I evolved into an administrator role and then eventually to my current role as a, a test manager. So in the beginning, our organization had nothing in terms of accessibility. It was not a priority. In fact, very few people had any idea that there were any standards around accessibility. So when a developer or an application analyst would receive a complaint from the community trying to access a website, the standard practice was to reach out to a single point of contact. That would be me as the only blind guy in the company. And they'd say, hey, Jeff, I've got this web page. I've got somebody that's saying they're having difficulty. Would you mind testing it for me? So I would, with the blessings of my leaders, I would put things aside and take the time to test a web page manually, which meant testing every link every heading, every button, every form field, every control to determine, could I use this page? So I would test, record my results in a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet and return the results to the developer and think, gosh, I hope this results in something meaningful. Unfortunately, very often the defects that were found were never mitigated. That was quite frustrating. Not to mention the time spent, the whole process was just very time consuming, very inefficient, and definitely not sustainable. And this went on for quite a few years. So we, we fast forward to late 2013. At that time, I transitioned and accepted a position with the quality assurance and testing team. Now, the beauty of the things that we do with the quality assurance and testing team is we provide automation. We provided automated tools that allow developers, application analysts, and the like to, well, automate their testing efforts. So I started thinking, gosh, what if we could automate accessibility testing? And with the support of my leaders in the quality assurance and testing team, we reached out across the organization and got some key stakeholders together, people from legal, compliance, IT, and other leadership positions. And we started talking about accessibility. We started to put together a committee and to develop a strategy. We started looking at vendor tool sets that were available. And I was really excited. There were some a real breadth of opportunities here to automate our testing and really make things easier for our application folks. So as we're going through this process, I wanna say in late 2016, executive leadership came to us and said, you know, we really don't have funding to continue with this effort. Can we put it on hold? And my thought was, no, we can't. We're gonna, face litigation, there's, there's a whole host of reasons why we should not close our front door to those who reach out to us for services. That kind of fell on deaf ears for a little while. As we rolled into 2017, our organization became the target of some litigation. And a few months later, 
we were contacted by the executive leadership and asked to recommence, reconvene, and continue our work on accessibility. So we did. And we resumed the process of vetting different automated solutions from different vendors. And at the same time, we formed, we officially formed a committee on accessibility for the entire enterprise. Over the next year, we worked with our legal counsel and we developed a system-wide policy on accessibility. And in January of 2019, our uh, policy was signed by the CEO. So we now had something in place that is legally binding that we had to have standards for accessible content. About the same time, we decided on DQ and their world space suite of tools. We just felt that they were the most comprehensive and offered the best solutions for what we were trying to accomplish. So over the past year, working with a couple of engineers on my team and other teams throughout the organization, we've been rolling out the world space comply and assure tools to various groups, especially focusing on those with externally facing content. And that's been very well received. We've got, I think five teams now up and testing their external content, both retroactively and on the fly. And it's, it's, it's really working out pretty well. In July of 2019, we partnered with DQ to implement the Attest HTML tool with our Providence Health Plans group. Now that's a key group because as an insurance company, they have a lot of externally facing content. You've got people logging in to select different health plans, select doctors, the nearest urgent care, what have you. So it's really important that this content is accessible to everybody. And at the end of this, we're gonna have uh, Mark and Tony read a testimonial. So that has been a success and they've got five of their websites up and successfully testing their content and they're testing on the fly as they proceed with new projects. Last week, we kicked off the process of implementing the Attest mobile build tool with our digital innovation group. And this is a group that has a couple of externally facing mobile apps that had previously not been tested. So their group is very excited about what is happening and they've received the tool very well thus far and we're gonna have them up and running within a month. So I'm very excited about that. And uh, you know, it's, it's been a real journey, but automation is, is so important. And our teams, as we push this out through the organization are really seeing the value of automation versus manual. So that is a little bit about our journey to accessibility in a, a large organization. We started off with a state-by-state -state regional support model, and now we are seven-state IT organization. So we're, we're, we're trying to push this out to all of our colleagues from Alaska to Texas. So very excited about that. At this point, I'd like to hand things off to Mark and Tony, and they are going to give us a demonstration on the Attest Build Tool. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, we, we love stories like this, you know, these success stories where, you know, we've got clients that have, uh, you know, gone through very similar processes uh, than, you know, Jeff's story. And, you know, they, they start small and, and kind of work into this really nice process. And, you know, a lot of times, like, what we see is, you know, struggle for that kind of like organization buy-in, um, you know, kind of like uncertainty around strategy and, and different things. And a lot of times that doesn't really come to, you know, like a, a major decision in, in a large organization, you know, without some kind of, you know, uh, compliance uh, or, you know, some type of legal action that really spurs it into, you know, like the mainstream. So, you know, when, when companies like Providence come to DQ and, and ask for help around, you know, hey, how do we take this process and, and you know, go from something where, you know, we're doing everything manually and, you know, we've got very little resources and work it into something where, you know, you are moving over into, you know, using tools to, you know, help kind of jumpstart these things and even into like automating some of these tests uh, with, with 
products that, you know, give you that extra ability, you know, kind of supplementing some of the uh, test cases that, that you might already be doing, you know, within your organization. So uh, we're going to take this time right now to uh, show you some of those tools and, you know, hopefully that'll um, kind of level set like what our, our story today was, was all about. And uh, Mark's going to kick us off with the, the browser extension. Oh, nice. Thanks, Tony. Um, so yeah, this is going to be the attest browser extension I'm going to show. Now the attest browser extension, um, is a really awesome tool. Um, it is a great starting point. If you don't have the capacity or setup time right now to do like unit testing, it's fine. It, the great part about it is you can cut your testing time in half if you're a developer or even a QA tester, right? And the cool thing about it is it can almost be used as a playground, um, in which you can actually fix accessibility issues on the fly. So. I'm going to turn myself away from the camera for a second because I'm going to look at my big screen here. Um, so as you guys can see on my screen right now, um, I have this DeQ Mars commuter site up. And this is a tester website. So when I run the scan here for accessibility stuff, you're going to see that there is a ton of issues that exist on this page. And that's supposed to be natural with it. That's all good. Um, so when I open up my browser, I'm going to inspect. Um, once I inspect, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into this world space tab. When I go into this world space tab, it's gonna open me up into this thing that says world space attest. And this extension that you see right here is gonna have this lovely button that says analyze on the left. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click it. And when I click it, it's scanning for 50% of WCAG violations. And then boom, I have this lovely layout right now that says, hey, here's all your violations that I found on your page. It's awesome because now in a nice neat format on the left I have buttons must have discernible text, elements must have sufficient color contrast, IDs, active elements must be unique, right? I've got all the different issues I have on my page in a nice, neat format. And it's really cool because in the middle of this, um, there's actually an inspect and a highlight button that'll show me where those accessibility issues are. So let's say, hey, I'm not the most knowledgeable with accessibility, right? I don't necessarily know how to get to those pieces and I don't necessarily know how to you know, fix those issues. That's fine. That's what this tool is gonna be for, right? So when I'm highlighting, I can actually traverse through and see where I am on the page. As you can see right now, as I click this button on the far right, I'm actually moving through the page and seeing different issues. Um, I can unhighlight, I can inspect the node. Um, so when I inspect the node itself, what ends up happening is it takes me directly to the inspector tool within either Firefox or Chrome, whatever your choice is. Um, so now when I come back to it, there's one more piece that's in here and I cannot stress this piece enough for everybody that's on this call. There's a learn more link to the far right. And this learn more link itself will take you to our public facing the Q university pages. Now, these public facing the Q university pages are how you, this guy right here, okay, with the t-shirt that everybody's talking about, um, learned accessibility is through this right here. Being able to actually know what the accessibility issues are, how to fix them, how to get around to them, right? This is how I learned accessibility is doing this type of stuff right here, right? And this allows you to create those developers like I talked about earlier. You're now creating developers that are able to know accessibility, fix accessibility issues, and then make accessible code going forward, right? To the point where if I came out to this, I could hit scan and guess what? There'll be zero issues that show up, right? I'd be axe clean, uh, as our CEO loves to say. Axe clean is the one we always try to go for, right? So we always wanna say you don't want to have any accessibility issues but this is a really good learning tool to teach developers how to fix accessibility issues right and everybody always looks at a tool like this initially and says well mark this is a qa tool come on okay sure it might look like a qa tool but i'm going to show you a little trick with this tool you can actually live change code and when you live change code it will actually rescan your page as it is so for instance i'm going to use this html element must have lang i'm going to inspect this node right here and let's say i'm a novice developer I'm gonna go in here and change the HTML lang attribute to say lang equals mark because you know what? I just want that, I just want that to go away because it says I just need to have a language attribute, right? I'm gonna come back out to here. I'm gonna rescan really quick. And oh, wait, wait, wait. Still here. Element must have oh, element must have a valid language attribute. Ha ah, ha, gotcha. Okay. So I'm gonna come back out to here and I'm gonna actually change this to a valid language attribute. Go on to it, and ta-da, it's gone. Right. So there is some major advantages to using a tool like this, even though, yes, it, to a point, it is a little bit more manual and it's a static scanning tool, a static state and time. Right. This tool is fantastic as a starting point. So if you don't have that buy in right 
their way to say, man, I, our company, we, we can't really get that development testing piece to within our build process, right? A tool just like this is going to get you the exact same look and feel, right? As you would right now, right? As you were having that in there, right? Yes, it is a static point in time and it is going to be on a page you have to have rendered, right? But you're still going to get 50% accessibility violations caught out. However, the catch with this is there's also a different tool that exists within it that allows you to get a little bit farther. So like for example, in the, in the side here, I have this analyze uh, dropdown. I'm going to click the dropdown and go to this thing called page insights. Okay. Page insights is a phenomenal tool and I'm going to explain to you why it is because it, it, it really does help you become an accessible minded person and developer or QA tester, right? Because now what I can do is I can come out to this and I'm going to click on one of these selected tools on the left. So on the left, I have headings, links, lists, images, focus, frames, objects, landmarks, and autocomplete. I'm going to select links. Okay. Cause I want you guys to see this. And in this links tool, if I highlight all the links on the page, it's going to highlight all the links that exist on my page right now. Okay. But on the right, it'll show me all the accessible text that shows up for those links. Let's say, I run the scan, I scan it and it says, hey, you've got no violations. You're awesome, right? Again, we're only at 50% of accessibility violations. So now if I go into page insights and let's say I go to this accessible text right here and I can see specifically the accessible text for all the different links on the page. I'm gonna show you guys one that would trick an automated tool right here. Send your kids to Mars with an exclamation mark and then send your kids to Mars, no exclamation mark, right? To an automated tool, like a test, guess what's gonna happen? It's gonna say, hey, you had two different pieces of text because one's got a little bit different verbiage to it, might have an extra space, right? You can trick an automated tool that way to say, hey, it's good to go. But in reality, what's the situation right here? You have the exact same, your text is, there's no differentiation between, right? The context between them is not different. So if I'm a screen reader user, I'm gonna hear send your kids to Mars, send your kids to Mars. No difference in those, right? Same thing with this one right here. It says fly with the Wookiee and then fly with the Wookiee with an exclamation mark, right? Page insights allows you to get a little bit more in depth on what you're looking for from a manual perspective as well. Um, I can't tell you how awesome this tool has been, um, especially in the implementations I've done with it um, and the wonders it does, again, for teaching developers to kind of do that little bit of manual testing you can get done um, with it, right? So that at a pretty good level is the attest extension itself. But the, the beauty of the attest extension and the thing that people always ask me, they always ask Tony, is they say, man, this functionality is awesome, right? How do, how do I get this functionality at a build time, right? We talked about the shift left mentality, right? And getting that buy-in. Let's say I get that buy-in and now I want to shift even farther left, right? Yes, I've developed content at this point, right? And I've got it out to okay, a point where I say, hey, uh, I can test it in my browser, but is there any way I can actually get this functionality within my build process? And that is the difference between a test, the extension, and then a test HTML, which is a build tool. So I'm going to turn it over to Tony now. Uh, we're going to walk you through the test HTML build tool itself. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. So uh, just like Mark was, uh, you know, alluding to when um, you know he was demoing the browser extension, is you know any time that you have a tool that can scan a page and you know, identify and allow for you know, developers or, or really anybody that uses it. You know, that's the beauty about the browser extension is that you know, QA folks can use it. You know, folks that are inside your uh, accessibility program, you know, like manual testers, people like that, it's a great tool for them. Um, but you know, what you can do is you can supercharge your you know, automated tests that your developers are probably already writing for the most part within your organization for the applications that they're building. And one of the ways that we can do that is by using the uh, a test browser or the uh, a test for HTML. Uh, we've got all these different integrations that we've built that you know, allows us to integrate our uh, API technology into these types of tests. And just for like a real, you know, like uh, kind of like overview of, of what these tests are, if people aren't familiar, is um, developers can write tests that essentially drive through a page just like a user would. And, you know, this is great to, you know, kind of confirm 
that things that we're expecting on the page, you know, like at different points of the application are in fact happening. And these tests can be automated to run every single time they change code or check into uh, something like GitHub. Uh, you know, you kick it off on your CI CD pipeline, like where every time it gets built, these tests can run. And uh, with the power of a test, what we can do is add that functionality. So like as these tests are, are running and, and doing those uh, business logic type, you know, uh, checks that, that these tests are designed to uh, uh, kind of a, you know, make sure and, and ensure that this functionality is happening every time, we can add accessibility checks into that. So when it runs, uh, you know, we can scan that page, the state of the page at the time uh, that this test is going and, in, you know, get all this information about accessibility on, on the page. And so uh, what we're going to show you right here uh, at a super high level, um, it's not going to go into like very much detail in regards to, you know, like how these tests work or some of the underlying technology to it. Um, the test that we're going to show is our a test puppeteer integration. And uh, on Mark's screen here, we're looking at a, uh, about four tests that are, are going to hit a couple different URLs. And essentially, it's just going to like show at a real high level that, you know, we're, we're going to drive to these, some of these sites and uh, just take a peek at them. And then uh, we're going to make a call into our a test API, and we're going to get those results back. And so, uh, Mark, if you can scroll up to the top of the page, um, very typically, um, here, what we have is the assets where we're going to be pulling those in uh, so we can add this uh, functionality into our, our tests here with this uh, a test reporter and a test puppeteer modules. Uh, these are private modules that, uh, you know, when you buy a license, you know, you get access to uh, through uh, DQ and, you know, our integration team helps you walk this, uh, walk through that installation. Uh, and so when, when you have those assets, uh, the, the real beauty of these APIs is that they're really designed that once you have those modules added to your, your test stack here, you can come down into uh, like your before setup, uh, initiate, initiate those, those bits of uh, API and, and functionality, set up your reporter and you know, kind of hook it into, in this case, Puppeteer, what we'd be using to um, you know, automate uh, the, the browser moving and, and clicking of buttons and things like that. And, you know, be able to add that accessibility functionality uh, to, to this technology. So um, each one of these pages, uh, we're going to hit this DQ University uh, demo page that, that Mark demoed with the browser extension. And uh, if you scroll down just a little bit, we'll, we'll get down into some of these tests. So you see just like real easily here, um, what we're doing is, is we're making a call to the attest puppeteer. Um, you know, like we're initiating this uh, uh, functionality from the, from the puppeteer driver and we call our analyze function. You know, we can do this anytime inside of one of these tests. So like you might build up a, a, a test where you have, uh, you know, you might go to a page and, you know, you might fill in a form and hit submit and then you want to run some accessibility tests, you know, it, everything in this sense, anything you can do with Puppeteer is fair game. You know, you can pretty much pick whatever point, whatever state you want to drive your application to, then make the call out to the API. And then uh, what that's going to do, once you make that call, is uh, you're going to get these results back. Uh, these results come back in a, like a raw JSON form. Uh, but what's really nice about this and some of the tools that's been built around it is uh, we've got these reporters uh, that transform these results into, you know, very readable HTML reports or uh, some JUnit XML for folks that might be pushing it up into like a, a Jenkins type of situation where they would, uh, you know, get an additional report, you know, like inside of that environment. And then, uh, within those results, what we can do is uh, take a look at either, you know, the number of violations that we have or, you know, in any array of things that you can do and you can write these assertions against those results. And what's great about that is, you know, like this creates safeguards against 
some of the things that we were talking about before, like when Mark was talking about, you know, he got in there, he's writing some code. Um, he might have changed something on the page that introduced an accessibility issue. Uh, without these kind of tests that are validating that, you know, like once you have a page where, you know, your number of violations here is equal to zero. And when, when this test runs, um, it's going to either pass or fail uh, when it hits that part of the test. Then, you know, when, when Mark comes in and, and makes some of those changes, you know, you're not going to know that that's a violation until it goes all the way down the pipe in, into, you know, your production environment. Then folks like Jeff's going to catch it, you know, and say, hey, you know, what, what's going on? What, what are you doing over here? And, uh, you know, it, it's a big, long process. So you can save a ton of time, ton of money by, you know, kind of implementing these types of uh, automated build uh, tests and, and these strategies around, you know, putting these kind of tests in critical parts of your application and making sure that, you know, once, you know, we've got this stuff in, in place and, and we've got a good plan around remediating some of these issues that we can in fact keep it that way. So Mark, let's go ahead and like kick this test off and, and we'll show uh, what kind of results we're gonna get and then um, we can kind of wrap it up. So Mark just ran the uh, command that's going to execute uh, this test suite and like what you'll see here as it runs is, you know, a little bit of output where, you know, it's going to say, uh, you know, we, we hit this page and we've uh, indeed encountered some issues. Uh, you'll get the full results back. And then once uh, that runs, you, you get these results over in your file system and it will write uh, the raw format, which is JSON. And that's, it's a big object. You know, there's a lot going on. Uh, this is the raw format, it's a very large file. Uh, but what we've done is, uh, you know, created some, some tools that will, you know, kind of pretty this up and, and make it so, you know, like you could pass this along to folks that, you know, wouldn't really be able to decipher what's going on in that JSON, but instead, you know, see this nice HTML page that, you know, it's got this report built in it. So uh, if you pull up the HTML report real quick, and click on one of those issues, you know, you'll see all of our violations here that we'll have it. They're all listed out. It's a nice, much more readable format. And the other thing that you'll notice is that this looks very similar to the UI that Mark was demonstrating in the browser extension. So we've got that learn more uh, link uh, as, as part of these results. Uh, you see what the impact level is of some of these issues. And, you know, it also gives you the information about the source code and the, the selector information, all, all the stuff that you see inside the browser extensions here. So it's really great. It's like you have like this kind of like uh, cohesive type of environment between what you're gonna get in the browser extension and what you're gonna get coming out of the API. And you know, kind of like what Mark was talking about too earlier is that you know there's a little bit of learning that happens here. Like when your developers are running these tests and it's happening uh, like at a regular interval, uh, you can't help but like, you know, really kind of absorb some of this information. So even if you're not an accessibility expert, um, just by writing these tests, you know, I, I think like you really get a good sense of what's right, what's wrong, things like that. And, and it just really starts to play into uh, building like a really nice program and, you know, coming up with these strategies to kind of take these issues and figure out how you're going to remediate and work them into your development environment and your development process. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and kind of bring this, bring this all kind of together at, at one step here. So um, for everybody in here, um, the integration that we did with the test tools that you just saw, um, I actually worked with Jeff um, to actually get these involved with. So, um, we do have some testimonial from someone who's used this tool before from Kyle Harborough. Um, I worked directly with him and with Jeff. They were fantastic to work with because when you have a team that has buy-in like these guys did, it makes life so much easier to get things done from an accessibility standpoint. So if you look at some of the things that they've done with the tool, they've integrated it um, into five different teams, five different pages, right? Um, the reports that they've generated, they're getting great value back out of that because Previous tools, again, look at right there. We've talked about this all presentation. Previous tools only identified the issue. They didn't do anything with them to be like, how do you fix this? What's the problem with it, right? Now, 
how everybody within Providence, you've got developers that are learning accessibility, making accessible content out the door. It's exactly what you want with these types of tools, right? Um, and again, we haven't talked much about this, but the cool thing that these guys did is they had an approach to this shift left mentality. It's a lot, right? It is. When you get into the shift left mentality to do these unit test cases, the one thing you have to know is that you have to have a game plan going in. Their game plan to start with was to fix the critical and serious issues right away, right? Because if you look at it holistically, when you first run these tools, you're going to look at it and you're probably going to have a lot of issues. Heck, I've seen people come up and be like, Mark, we've got 400 issues. What do we do, right? Develop a strategy within that to kind of say, hey, we're going to fix the critical and serious issues. And they have done that and had great success doing that um, at that point. And again, they've started to see their content become cleaner. They've seen a decrease in the number of accessibility issues in the application. And just a few weeks ago, they pushed a color platelet change for one of their Providence Links pages that was discovered during this testing. So this tool works wonders within their actual projects themselves. And Providence as a group has done this shift left mentality with such, I, I can't think of a word right now. I'm just gonna say it's awesomeness. <laughs> I mean, they really have. Working with Jeff and his team they have that buy-in. If you have that buy-in to get to that developer testing and that shift left mentality from testing way over here on the right to getting it all the way down developer level, now you're creating that, right? Um, and that's, that's the, the big thing that Providence has gotten from this and a lot of people have gotten from the tool then as well. Yeah, so, you know, just to kind of like wrap it every, everything up that, you know, for testing and, you know, having things be, uh, you know, like th these agile types of um, processes and, and working stuff into automated tests, it's incredibly important to find this type of, um, you know, synergy, like with your teams and, and make sure that, you know, wh when you get it implemented and everything's working well, you know, like it's a dramatic reduction of the amount of effort your developers have to do uh, to find these issues and fix these issues. Um, and then like really the marriage between the browser extension and the, uh, the, the, the APIs is that, you know, like developers can utilize that browser extension and it's a really great tool to, you know, work, you know, kind of like what Mark was showing, like in, inside the, the source code, you know, without having to write a bunch of code and, you know, check it in and, and see if the test passes and all that other stuff. Uh, you know, you can work inside that browser extension and really close your feedback loop in and really tight. You know, you get a lot of stuff done, you know, more quickly. And then the other thing that happens in this, in, you know, type of situation is, you know, you're freeing up the resources of the folks like Jeff that, you know, they can focus on like the more critical issues and, and the things that really take the expertise of the accessibility, you know, professionals and, and the QA teams to focus on, on that type of stuff, you know, so like, you're building accountability in with your dev team, you know, you're working it into your process, you're, you're utilizing the tests that you've probably already got an investment in as part of your application. And, you know, like this type of, um, you know, integration and, uh, you know, it just allows for folks to, you know, like work faster, work smarter and, and work better. Awesome. So, with that, <laughs> that's, that's what we've got. So we will open it up then for your guys' questions online. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Okay, we have quite a few questions rolling in. Again, as a reminder, if we don't, answer, if we don't get to answer your question live here, we will be following up with you. So all questions will get answered one way or another. <clears throat> uh, the first one is for Jeff. Uh, did Providence developers start coding with accessibility in mind, and did they see initial test results improve? I would say absolutely not. They did not start coding with accessibility in mind initially. That is something that we are shifting the focus to. Um, the groups that we have introduced the tools in the world space suite to are embracing that concept and are now starting to code with accessibility in mind, especially our health plans group that you just saw the, the uh, uh, a testimonial from. They are baking accessibility into everything that they do now. And our digital innovation group is also starting to do the same thing. So we have a lot of teams who are retroactively testing and, and we'll soon hopefully see the value and become 
to the point to mature to the point where they're going to, to build it in like like our health plans team is doing. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Sure. Okay, there are quite a few questions asking about the difference between some of our tools. So how is the the attest tool different from the Axe Chrome extension? And then a follow up to that is how is a test different from Axe, the Axe Pro beta? Gotcha. Um, Tony, if I miss anything, you can chime in. Um, so watching. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you're looking at the first question, so if you're looking at Axe, the Chrome extension versus Axe or versus a test Chrome extension, right? Here's your big differences. Um, a test has the page insights tool. Um, it has the ability to do scoping. Um, and it also has the great functionality that includes you getting the latest version of Axe core before anybody else. Um, and so one of the things that you have to know is yes, the Axe tool will scan your content. It is a free extension that's out there. However, the attested browser extension itself, it has more content within it as far as, you know, doing a little bit more manual testing, allowing for a little bit more customization. The one thing that I didn't show on there um, is that you actually have the ability to use custom rules within it as well. So if your organization has some different custom things that you want to do as far as ruling goes, um, the attest browser extension has that versus the Axe extension. Now, the question is Axe Pro Beta versus the test um, right now. As of right now, they're pretty different. The Axe Pro Beta actually has a full walkthrough um, in there. So it'll actually like walk you through your, uh, your actual sites, tell you you should test this content, right? It really does help you learn how to do accessibility testing. Um, a test isn't there just yet. Um, it's going to get there eventually. Um, but right now a test is kind of more tied to the world space test product suite where you can use those custom rules, right? You can use page insights to do your content and you can get that 50% scan. Um, but Axe Pro Beta kind of has that more robust walkthrough piece to it where it will get you the step-by-step -step, um, testing or testing steps within your actual application. And it has some new machine learning stuff within it as well. Tony, is there anything to add to anything I missed in there? No, not really. I mean, you know, like you, you'll get just a little more functionality in, in regards to, you know, the way that it ties into you know business logic and and some of the strategy uh, that that Jeff was talking about earlier, you know, so like if you've got an org strategy uh, that you know is is you know customized in a certain way, uh, you know that that tool is going to work out way better for you, and you know you get a lot more value out of it. Great, thanks, guys. Okay, um, in the DQ web curriculum, it says experts agree that automative testing only catches a third of the issues and then manual testing is required. So you guys are saying that a test catches 50%? So this one's always tricky. So when we say 50%, it's 50% of WCAG violations that will not get false positives within it, right? So when you're looking at it from that standpoint, manual testing is always going to have to be involved. I, I'm a developer at heart. I can tell you that right now, but I will tell you that you have to do manual testing no matter what way you, you get around it, right? The cool thing about something like this where you are getting those percentages of issues, right? The cool thing about it is, is that at this time, if I catch those low hanging fruits and, and, acts, and, and a test can actually get ones that are a little bit more complex too, what I'm doing is I'm creating accessible content from the ground up, right? Because a lot of times where you see some of the manual issues come into play is where you stack those things on top of each other, those low hanging fruits over and over and over again, right? And a test will help you catch those pieces. Now, will it 110% say, yes, guess what? I ran this within my project and I have no accessibility issues. No, it, we're, accessibility automation is not to that point yet all around, right? So when you look at it from that standpoint, you should always have a manual testing plan in place for your content, which is why within the test extension, we like to actually have that page insights piece in there, or if you're lucky enough to have the Axe Pro beta piece in there to kind of teach you how, yes, you've gotten to that 50%, but hey, make sure you check for this. Make sure you do some testing with this, right? Keyboard testing, color contrast testing, you'll get for your point, but um, other things in there that this tool will help you get to that point um, as well. And there's some other functionality we didn't talk about within the test browser extension too, um, that will let you get and get and kind of give you some clues as to, Hey, you should test this content in there too. Right. Anything to add to that, Tony? No, no, I think you got it. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks, Mark. 
Okay, another question here. Would you say that there is an advantage to using world space to test um, over X if you are in QA or is it mainly just useful to devs? Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. So I'll say, I'll say my piece on it. So I would say world space, the, the attest extension itself. Um, yes, it is made primarily for um, developers to use. However, I have seen so many QA teams use the attest extension for the couple of reasons. One, it has a custom rules ability, right? So I can add a custom rule. So if I have custom accessibility checks that I'm doing for my organization, I can add those in. But the other part, big time, is page insights and then the other pieces in there. Um, I didn't show it in the actual um, demo because we, we could show an hour's worth of it with the demo. Um, there's actually a needs review column in there that'll actually test content and say, hey, I couldn't figure out this is an accessibility issue. You should test this content though, right? To make sure that it's not a violation. And that inherently is why I say the attest extension itself is really good for QA teams because it has the page insights tool that I showed where you can get a little bit more manual testing and it has the needs review category in there to say, Hey, you should check this out. Right. That gives you a more robust look at accessibility on your page. Does it get you hundred percent all the way there? Like every manual test? Absolutely not. But again, it's more robust in the way that you can actually get those issues. And we didn't even show you, you can export the issues from the attest extension into a CSV and then go from there. So I would say the attest extension is more robust and useful at that level than Axis, because Axis really is going to allow you to scan, inspect, and then change things with it, right? This is more robust in the way that a QA team could use some of the functionality in it. Awesome. Yeah, the, the only thing I'd add to that is, you know, like from an organization standpoint, um, the attest tool is, is more of our enterprise um, product. And what that means is if you've got uh, your dev teams and, you know, other folks, you know, kind of using the browser extension and some of the other APIs and, and things like that, um, they're all built to work together. And, and one of the things that uh, is key is, you know, like within your organization, sometimes there's, um, you know, certain rule sets or, you know, like you might want to land on a certain version of um, like X, X Pro or uh, X Core uh, to, to power your tests with. And that, that's important, like when you're dealing with the APIs and different things like that, because when you're, when you're running through this content and you're getting these results back, you want to make sure that the QA folks are looking at the same thing that the developers are and the results that they're getting back are all kind of like in line. And the, um, the, a, a test is, is built specifically for that purpose it, to be deployed across your whole organization. Great. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Mark. Okay. We got time for a few more questions here. See. Okay, here's a question. I understand that this is mostly fixing HTML, but has it been tested against Dragon, JAWS, Zoom Text, uh, VO, TalkBack? How do they work with the abnormality of each assistive technology? That is a really good question. So what I'll say with it is this, this is why automation can only get to a certain point. There are those abnormalities that exist from assistive technology to assistive technology to assistive technology and browser combos, right? That's why you can only get to that 50% of accessibility testing really with tools like this. Um, because really what you're looking at is those abnormalities are gonna appear and we can't automatically get those things. That's where I say, you know, over and over again, you have to have a manual testing um, plan in place still, even with these tools. Um, because really, you know, most organizations that, you know, myself, even Jeff and Tony, right, they probably have a set assistive technology browser combo that they're going to go with, right? But somebody might go to your site and say, hey, this doesn't necessarily work when I'm using DragonSpeak, right? Or if I'm using NVDA um, and Firefox. The thing with it is that you're going to get those low hanging fruits with a tool like this. Um, that more or less are the universal ones um, across different assistive technologies. Um, but the abnormalities, that's where you have that manual testing piece in place. Now, if you're using one of our tools, like the test extension it is accessible um, with all different assistive technologies across it too. Anything to, anything to add to that, Tony? I don't think that was it. 
No, I don't think so. I mean, you know, okay. like, in, in like, so the tool itself, you know, like, keep in mind that it's, it's all built like on top of the, the X core platform, you know, which is the standard for like these types of automated tests. Uh, like when these tools are developed, you know, like if, you know, if we're, we're speaking to the UI of the browser extension or other things, that too has been coded to standards, you know, fully, uh, you know, accessible, like in, you know, I, I don't know, from the standpoint of, you know, being able to use those types of um, ATs on, on the tool itself. But, you know, like, yeah, the, the, these are developer tools mostly in, in that, you know, they'll be used to help remediate code and, and find and fix some of these issues that you'll have within your application. Great, thanks guys. Okay, a couple more questions here. Does a test have the capability to allow us to create customized accessibility tests based on our organizational needs? Uh, for example, if a certain class name is used, um, they want to check that certain accessibility rules and attributes are applied. Hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, so what's great about the API is that it's incredibly flexible. Um, it's made to, um, you know, be used for like these types of exact situations. So, you know, if you've got tests and things and, you know, specific attributes or, you know, like I, I've, I've built very elaborate wrappers around, a, you know, like the actual call to the analyze function within our API. And, you know, you can do lots of different things like in regards to like the way it reports back or, you know, like even when you're starting, you know, like down the accessibility, um, path in, in, you know, working on remediation, you know, Mark mentioned this earlier in the story was that, you know, when you start out, you know, yeah, you might have a page that has 400 issues. Well, you know, to create a strategy around that, you might want to, you know, develop a, a way of, you know, maybe just targeting those critical issues first. So, you know, if there's, uh, you know, like an approach that you want to take or, or things like that, this, this API is incredibly flexible to, you know, kind of make it work the way that you want it to work or, or you know, fit into your code that the way that you want it to fit into the code. And then when you call the analyze function, it's going to go scan, do its thing, you know, get you back all that data. And then, you know, you kind of put it into your process and, and go from there. Great, thanks, Tony. Okay, somebody asked, uh, is this a paid extension? I'm not seeing it in Google. Yes. Yep. Our public one is the Axe extension, which I think somebody had asked that question um, earlier. The attest extension is with our enterprise license for world space products. Um, so yeah, it's a paid one. Great. Okay, a couple more questions here. We won't be getting to all of these questions, but then again, as a reminder, we will be following up with you if we didn't get to yours, but I think we have time for one more question. And it looks like this person is live uh, at the CSUN location. So that's great. Um, do you have best practices that you provide to the developers on how to actually fix common found, common found errors to make it easier and work into the process? Um, oh, I see the full question there too. Um, so, okay. so. Do you have best practices? That you've so, so the way that I would say to use that is kind of like this. It kind of goes back to the approach. And, and Tony, you might have a different answer than I do on this. Um, as far as like fixing your issues with it, initially we showed you within like the attest extension and the attest HTML tool, there's those learn more links um, that'll take you out to how to fix those issues. The cool part about it is a lot of people actually We'll use that initially to be like, okay, hey, how do I fix this issue, right? And then organizationally, they'll actually go back and look at that content um, and add it to somewhat of a, you know, standard way of fixing that content with it too. So like when I worked with, um, with Jeff and I was working with Kyle, the first thing that Kyle asked me is, you know, how would you approach this, right? And we kind of talked about, you know, attacking those critical and serious issues, but then making sure that developers we're able to look at those uh, public facing pages to understand the issues and how to fix them. And then as they go along, yes, you could develop standards on how specifically you want to fix it 
within an organization. So what I mean by you guys fixing it is, let's say you have like a common component library and you say on this, yes, this is not gonna have the correct markup. So you need to have a role equals button and a tab index of zero, right? Whenever you make this content, right? Um, that's just something to look at as far as um, like a best practice or way that you could just commonly fix issues is using those links right there. And Tony, do you have any other approach you could think of with that? Well, I would just, I, I guess I'd take this a different direction. Okay. That, you know, part of when, you know, you, you buy a license and in the, the integration process of, you know, DQ working with your organization to get uh, these APIs and, you know, these, these products installed uh, is part of the service that comes with it. And my team, uh, which we call Dev Services here at DQ, uh, which Mark's part of, is, you know, we are, uh, you know, we're professionals that get this stuff set up. So like we've seen all these different types of scenarios, uh, you know, everybody's setups a little bit different. Um, but then we also talk about strategies and we talk about ways to, you know, I know the question was best practices around fixing code, but you know, like, yeah, I mean, like you get access to folks that have done it a lot and, you know, can really give, you know, some direction around these types of, these types of issues. So um, it is not just kind of like a, a product in that regard, you know, it, it's a relationship uh, between DQ and the organization. And I, I think there's a lot of value that comes with that. Absolutely. All right, well, it looks like we're out of time. Uh, thank you, Mark, Tony, and Jeff. Uh, this was really great. And thank you for everybody who attended. We really appreciate you joining the session. And uh, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank, thank you, everybody. everyone. It's been great. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. Bye, guys. Thank you.